Rabbi Sasha Borshish, who is a friend of mine, although we haven't been in touch for about 20 years. <laughs> uh, he, he's a, one of the leading creation sociologists, and he works in this area of uh, transnationalism, migration, sociology of ethnicity and nationalism, but also sociology of emotions and, and more recently theories of social space. Uh, and he's also the president of the Croatian Sociological Association uh, and is involved to some extent with a cultural sociology program that we, Andreas, is leading on, on, on this side of the pond. <laughs> so today, uh, Sasha will be talking about uh, why bother with Asper. <laughs> yes, I'm going to bother you with diaspora today. The question is why would I do such a thing as considering um, how good a host was uh, Sinish on this day. So, yeah. And also, uh, I see that some people realize that I bothered uh, with you and uh, the concept of diaspora. And nevertheless, uh, the question is really why should we talk about uh, concepts such as diaspora? Because uh, when we look at the proliferation of the meanings uh, the ways in which the term and the concept has been used, we can say that uh, it's gone beyond uh, any meaningful uh, use. Uh, but I think precisely because it is uh, such a, a term with a lot of meaning, which, is, uh, which has been uh, proliferated uh, for the last 20 years, that we have to come back and think about how really can we find a consensus on uh, what diaspora is and how should it be studied. Uh, there are many other concepts and terms that have had the same um, fate, so to speak. Uh, if you remember postmodernism or if you remember um, transnationalism as well, uh, these are the terms that were promising, the concepts were promising, but then in the end uh, we didn't uh, actually find any <clears throat> feasible studies that could refer to other studies that actually accumulate some sort of knowledge. Therefore, I would say we have to deal with diaspora. And also, uh, there are many people um, in everyday life who identify themselves as diasporans. And also, in, in the public discourse, diaspora becomes um, again and again. There is an ebb and flow always of, of the use of the term and uh, also um, identification. Uh, in Croatia, for example, uh, when we talk about diaspora and when you look at the media, uh, it seems that it is primarily uh, some sort of condition. You are in diaspora, so to speak. Um, it is a kind of condition that is not desirable because um, the homeland is always envisaged as something natural to be born into and then to stay there uh, and to die there eventually. Uh, but uh, to be in diaspora then it is some sort of unnatural state and obviously people have to uh, experience all kinds of difficulties and one of them would be uh, loss of education for example. The other way <clears throat> the term is used is when they speak about uh, collectivities. They envisage diaspora as some sort of entity, um, just like many uh, social scientists and sociologists, when the journalists speak about diaspora, they speak about um, some sort of ethno-national entity outside of the borders of nation-states, which are primarily perceived as um, the homeland. Therefore, um, it is a nationalistic discourse, but recently uh, there has also been um, that there was a new way of using uh, the term within the public discourse, and this is uh, the term of, well, using it as, as a form of, um, as a, some sort of transnation. It is a sector of a transnation that outgrew the boundaries of uh, nation states. <clears throat> Authors like Tullian and um, also Michelle Aguero were speaking about this. But interestingly, also the journalists are now uh, finding that uh, transnation is some sort of, um, they're not using specifically the term transnation, but they're using the term diaspora to say that um, we have several sectors. There are people who are in the homeland, within the boundaries of nation state. Uh, there are people who are outside of these boundaries. One sector are the migrants and their descendants who are scattered all over the world. And the third sector are basically the members of minorities in the neighboring countries who were also artificially <clears throat> left behind in some other state, like for example Bosnia and Herzegovina or Serbia, or Hungary, or other countries. So all these combined together then comprise transnation. And what it, interestingly also in public discourse it is also when they speak about diaspora, sometimes they think about uh, diaspora as a transnation. And also our uh, um, law, uh, especially when you look at the um, 
elections, uh, the law treats diaspora as a, some sort of um, spatial, um, as some sort of uh, specific space outside of uh, the nation state. So basically, um, you envisage a sector of the homeland outside of the, the boundaries of the nation state, and it is some sort of a global uh, spatial unit within uh, the elections themselves. So Croatia is, according to, and also Italy and Haiti, uh, are envisaged as some sort of global nation states because wherever there are Croatians or Haitians, there is Croatia or Haiti. Uh, and they should all, uh, as some sort of 10th or additional district, be a part of the political system and of nation states. Um, the proliferation of the term was, I think, uh, bestly, uh, I mean, the, the best author to um, comprise all these uh, ideas was Rogers Brubay. Almost ten years ago, he wrote about diaspora, diaspora. Uh, basically saying that there is a dispersion of meanings of the term in a semantic, conceptual and disciplinary space. So diaspora itself is uh, dispersed, is diasporic in a way. There is, there is a proliferation of putative diasporas, but also a proliferation of uh, terms. What happened then is that not only we have uh, different meanings of the term, but we also have uh, different terms that are covering specific aspects of it. For example, dias diasporicity or diasporism, when we talk about collectivity or condition. Uh, also, when we talk about process, we speak about diasporization, de-diasporization, re-diasporization. Interestingly, also, within the public discourse, this is also used. And um, the identity of many people, of many, for example, Croatians abroad, uh, has been uh, ethnicized over during the 90s and then declined during um, the first decade uh, of the new uh, century. And now it is becoming more salient again. So it is, I would say, also uh, visible as a process, re is visible as a process. Also, it is a field of inquiry, diasporology or diasporistics. Actually, these terms were used. Then, uh, stance or a position with the adjective diasporist. Um, according to Brubaker, this is precisely what we should look after. This is precisely what we should um, research. We'll see why. And also, the term diasporic diaspora was reserved for uh, attributes or modality. But uh, Brubaker was trying to um, cross the boundaries and uh, think of diaspora even more widely, and then he made a joke, basically saying, why not diasporicity to designate the permeability of the boundaries of the diaspora? Why not diasporific to characterize the catastrophic origins of many diasporas? Why not uh, diasporography as a new term for the global trafficking industry? Why not diasporfolio as a new global investment strategy? Diaspersion, Dan Kynes' remark about diaspora. <laughs> Diasporapathy, to characterize putative members of diaspora who do not respond to the appeals of diaspora activists. <laughs> and diasperanto, a project for a common language of the diaspora. Uh, well, after you see this, then you really ask yourself, why bother with diaspora? Because because of it. But uh, he thinks that um, there are three core elements we can uh, find, uh, three core elements understood to be constitutive of diaspora since uh, the early writings like uh, from Schaeffer or Sutton. And still we can find them uh, today. So it is that uh, dispersion, any kind of dispersion in space across state borders, regardless whether there is a migration behind it or not, for example, Clef diaspora, say, uh, is a term used by Riggs, who um, describes the population that became diaspora through boundary drawing, uh, for example, like um, Serbs in Bosnia and Croatia after the dissolution of Yugoslavia would be a cleft diaspora. Uh, also, homeland orientation. These are specific markers that tell us uh, that this is a specific social form. Uh, without homeland orientation, we cannot speak about diaspora. So, homeland is an authoritative source of value, identity, and loyalty. 
Uh, and finally, boundary maintenance, uh, distinctive community held together by distinctive active solidarity as well as by relatively dense social relationships. Now that we have at least three uh, minimum markers to say how can this phenomenon, social phenomenon, differ from others, then Brubaker goes on and attacks each of these and uh, comes to the conclusion that we cannot essentialize, even when we speak about dispersion, formal orientation, boundary maintenance, uh, we cannot really draw this clear boundary and say this is where the diaspora begins and this is where the diaspora ends. Uh, nevertheless, diaspora is always a category of practice. If we look at the, uh, how the people who describe themselves as diasporans use it, when we look at the journalists how they use it, when we look at the politicians how they use it, then yes, it is a category of practice. It is a project. It is a claim and stance rather than a bounded group. It is an ethno-demographic or ethno-cultural fact. And the such fact that it can be researched, it should be researched. Uh, and through stances, projects, claims, idioms, practices. So our task, according to Brubaker, would be to study empirically the degree and form of support for diasporic projects among members of its putative constituents. However, uh, I think that this um, idea or this uh, direction that Brubaker gave to uh, all social scientists, what should, should be done in the case of diaspora, is uh, actually um, overseeing the fact that there are many people who do not gather around certain projects or who do not gather con uh, continuously around certain projects but who do believe that they are desperate, who feel that they are desperate, who feel that their homeland is somewhere else or that they have several homelands. So the, uh, the phenomenon itself is a bit uh, more complex than just uh, to say that we, you know, we have to concentrate on one project and then uh, look at the rallying around it and uh, to, to see uh, what is the degree and form of support for this project. So, what constitutes diaspora is not only a project in the degree uh, of support, but also it includes feelings, it, uh, it includes imagination, it includes specific conception and action of um, individuals. Um, so people do feel uh, that they are in diaspora or have this condition of diaspora. They imagine uh, certain spaces as their homelands, or sometimes invent them. Uh, sometimes they even want to conquer them, uh, but still they have to some, have some sort of concept of where, where is this homeland if we are not inhabiting it. Um, and also you can then see specific actions that can be political, cultural, economic, and are oriented towards uh, the homeland. Therefore, I would say it is not only about rallying and about mobilization because authors like, uh, for example, Sukerfeld was trying to do research um, they, uh, using the ideas of Brubaker and realized that uh, in the end, yes, mobilization is the most, probably the most important part of uh, the whole phenomenon because without mobilization, without bringing people uh, to support these projects and, uh, and claims, there is no diaspora. Uh, nevertheless, I would, I would argue when we look at the um, reports uh, by different authors and also by diasporans themselves, they will say, yes, uh, I am a part of diaspora, although I do, I do not uh, engage in any kind of political uh, project, I just feel it. Um, so diaspora is felt, it is imagined, it is conceived, and it is made. And once constituted, it exists as a social phenomenon which is observable in specific dimensions. Um, I would say that our task is then uh, really to see how these dimensions are interconnected, uh, to see how diaspora varies, how does diaspora as a social phenomenon be, uh, behave. Um, some authors try also to uh, build on diaspora, diaspora concept, like Eva Moravska, and she uh, clearly give a good account of uh, multiplicity of forms and contents of diaspora's orientations. But in the end, you can only conclude that this polymorph uh, diaspora, as she terms it, um, doesn't really maybe cover the single phenomenon. We have to see whether uh, all these actions, feelings, um, also conceptions, really interrelate somehow. So what distinguishes diaspora from other social phenomena is the existence of one or more homelands, definitely, if uh, 
there is no this tension between home and homeland, and um, you can hardly speak about a diaspora in form of a feeling or um, some sort of perception or action. So it is that these homelands can be real or imagined or utopic places in geographical spaces, but they're not inhabited by those who feel, imagine, and conceive them. And instead of new definitions and some sort of invention of new terms like diaspora and diaspora, uh, I think that we should concentrate on multidimensional variation of the diaspora phenomenon. So diaspora behaves and varies as a social phenomenon. And I would say this through feelings, through conceptions, through action of, uh, actions of the individuals. Uh, one of the authors who um, introduced this kind of thinking in social science is Donald Black. He's a uh, very strict, um, he invented the term pure sociology, uh, basically saying that uh, we should explore social phenomena as if they were behaving, not individuals. So individuals who uh, um, feel and think and have motivations are not the agents, it's not important. What is important is to see, uh, is there a certain social form, how can we um, really a, a, a spot the most important elements of this phenomenon and then see what is the internal structure of this phenomenon. And according to this internal structure, then we can foresee how um, this phenomenon will develop. Now, um, we might ask ourselves, what is the pure form of diaspora? It is very difficult to, um, to say what it is, but we saw these three basic elements, these three um, critical minimum markers, so to speak, um, which differ diaspora from other social forms. So diaspora is a social phenomenon which is constituted by discrepancy of home and homeland and which manifests itself through individual and collective feelings, thoughts and actions. I would say this is the something that differs diaspora from ethnic colonies, something that differs diaspora from um, ethnic minorities. It is precisely this tension between uh, inhabited and non-inhabited is that really constitutes uh, diaspora as a social phenomenon through these feelings, thoughts, and actions. So maybe we can use this black in ontology and say social phenomena have their phenomena have their uh, um, real life, so to speak. But without purification, without his perfect geometry, he introduces very interesting uh, notions. How should we study social phenomena? I would say that we can study variation in feelings and mental representations and actions and see how they really uh, these variations relate. Uh, Black said that he assassinated the person basically by saying that we are not into methodological individualism and we do not care what uh, you know, motivations and what individual goals of individuals are, but we should study, uh, we should be sociologists without anthropocentrism, psychology, teleology, and ideology. Because every instance of human behavior has its multidimensional location and direction in social space. So sociology is some sort of uh, social geometry. And this is a very optimistic and very uh, pure sociological point of view. I'm not saying that it works, but I'm saying that uh, we cannot deny that uh, social phenomena have their own uh, life, so to speak, without, when we look at it uh, on, on a macro level, and when we look at the ebb and flow of certain activities, then we can definitely say yes, uh, there is more of diaspora, less of diaspora. Uh, there is more of this kind of diaspora and less of this. Um, I'm not going to bother now with uh, black, you just we can talk about later if you're interested. Maybe this is a typical oops, sorry. So this is the um, this is a typical Blackian statement. In modern life, for instance, the behavior of God is predictable from the shape of social space. He does not participate in every aspect of a person's life to the same degree, nor does he participate equally in every aspect of a society. He participates only when people call upon him, when they pray or perform rituals, and when he chooses to do so. God is a variable. He is more active in an upward direction against superiors than in a downward direction against inferiors. Supernatural life of every kind is socially specific. It is not constant across persons and societies. It has specific locations and directions in social space. It has a social structure. So when we look at the behavior of supernatural life, 
through individual acts of worshiping or calling or building a church, then we say, yes, this is where um, supernatural life occurs through social life. And we can see that there is more of it or less of it in certain situations. So uh, when we look at how these social phenomena operate, then black would say definitely through five dimensions, horizontal, uh, vertical, symbolic, uh, corporate, normative, I'm not going to talk about it now, but uh, also it has a direction, each social act has a, uh, has a direction, it can be downward, it can be upward, lateral, or radial, depending, are we talking about the um, relationship between statuses or between uh, people who are more or less integrated and so on. For example, a lawsuit brought by a wealthy person against someone less wealthy has both high elevation and downward direction. Um, a case might be a similar be high and upward, high and lateral, low and downward, low and lateral, downward and distant, from a high to a low elevation, and so on. So, a lawsuit by an integrated individual, for example, employed family person, against a marginal individual, such as uh, an unemployed vagrant, has an outward direction. And he would predict that uh, there are higher chances always that such a person would in a, some sort of litigious situation would win. Um, so in the end he comes up with these kinds of uh, statements that are describing the social geometry of every social phenomenon. For example, law is a curvilinear function of relational and cultural distance, and higher and downward law is greater than lower and upward law, which is basically a very simple statement that uh, uh, the law is not going to intervene if, for example, two people who are very close, uh, uh, who, um, who know each other, uh, have some sort of um, dispute. So the, the chances that the police will, for example, intervene in some sort of domestic dispute are relatively low. But when we look at the uh, disputes between people who are not so close, then this is where the law comes in, the police intervenes, the chances that the um, the court, in this case, would be, um, become um, some sort of um, It will come to the court that the punishment will be higher, are greater uh, when we look at the distance, the, the more the greater the distance, the chances are greater. But then at a certain point, it declines again. So a lawsuit by a, a complete foreigner to a certain country uh, against somebody um, in the country has less chances to succeed. Scientificity as well. Uh, is some sort of geometric, he has a geometric statement about scientificity as some sort of testability, validity, generality, simplicity, or originality of, a, of an idea, of an account of the world. So, scientificity is a curvilinear function of social distance from the subject. Basically, the scientificity grows with the distance from the subject. If we are too close to our subject, then our scientificity is very low, and social sciences are very low. Scientificity according to black, precisely because we are too close to our um, subject. Um, also, the uh, scientificity is uh, getting smaller or declining uh, when our uh, subjects are too distant. For example, black holes or ghosts or anything else that is too distant from us. Again, the scientists will claim about such a phenomenon falls. He would say that um, also the ideas that certain people present um, the chances of their success also follow this pattern. Um, so if somebody who is too close to you is telling you something about diaspora, you will not believe it, or the chances that you will believe it. So seems shall be, according to Black, more skeptical about what I'm saying now mm. than somebody who doesn't know me. Um, but also somebody from the street would also be more skeptical about uh, these, these kind of statements are very um, Rigid, they um, they claim that they grasp the uh, social geometry of each phenomenon. I do not believe that, that you know such geometry is possible. I tried to apply it on migration, uh, it didn't work. I tried to apply it on corruption, it worked to a certain extent. Uh, but all these very rigid uh, um, statements do not actually cover, I would say, the, the whole complexity of social reality. Nevertheless. The ontology of Donald Black is quite interesting because I think we are too immersed in uh, methodological individualism. This kind of point, uh, this point of view, uh, where everything has to be 
really explain on the basis of, for example, personal choice within the situation or any other um, epistemology is not so, I mean, it's not really bringing us any further. Therefore, maybe um, if you look at the behavior of the phenomenon itself, maybe we have then uh, greater chances to make statements uh, that would make more sense and also be more predictable. I mean, uh, could, could uh, improve that predictability. Variations include single and multiple homeless, for example, in the case of behavioral diaspora. Uh, single and complex identities, uh, binational and transnational positioning and uh, organization, etc. So, there is no need to exclude complex configurations and simply call them polymorphs, uh, and which include, for example, co um, continents and so on, global dispersal, occasional engagement, hybrid identities, all these um, points where diaspora ceases to be a kind of single phenomenon. Uh, maybe there is a continuum between all these dimensions. And I would argue that um, the possibility to bring a diaspora research forward would be to really envisage all these dimensions and try to see the variation of how diaspora is felt, imagined and done. Uh, and then when we, when we try to compare different cases, we might come to a conclusion that, uh, you know, that there might be more regularities than we originally thought. Therefore, diaspora is a very variable phenomenon which is observable in several interconnected dimensions and there are sub-dimensions which do not have privacy in explaining the variation of the phenomenon. Uh, for example, when you look at the emotions, um, people have a certain intensity of feeling of displacement. They can be more or less um, both uh, there is a direction of emotions that usually diasporas or people who feel diaspora um, describe. For example, from negative static like uh, nostalgia to negative dynamic such as uh, anger or hate towards um, the country itself, towards uh, those who expelled them, maybe towards uh, those who didn't help them, way, but still in reference to uh, the places and spaces that they had to leave, or maybe even their ancestors had to leave. Also, there are some mild positive emotions such as sympathy, but the continuum goes on maybe to strong positive emotions such as pride about uh, the lost uh, homeland or its achievements or whatever. Then when we look at the um, variation in identification again, it doesn't have to be so uh, fragmented. Maybe we are talking about continuum. For example, uh, within host society, do they identify with the so-called host society? Do they identify with the locality? Do they identify with the region or nation state? Also, when they talk about homeland or second homeland or uh, lost homeland, do they talk about in micro diasporic terms about certain locality? Uh, we had in our research interesting people from Chile, third, fourth generations who are micro diasporans. They describe themselves as Croatians, but their main point of reference is the island of Baraj. And when you ask them what is the capital of Croatia, they usually say it's the island of Baraj. Uh, so that it, it is their uh, homeland, it is locality. Sometimes uh, they identify with transnational regions, such as Istria, for example. Uh, they have Istrian identity. Think of Istria initially in northern Croatia that was uh, this, uh, heavily. Disputed over centuries between uh, different groups and different later different nation states, uh, they just do see themselves as Istrian um, diasporans and so on. <clears throat> but also, why not continents? When you look at the uh, American professional, African American professional boxers who started in the seventies, when they come to Africa, they say, "This is my home, uh, my homeland. I'm proud to, uh, to be here." They feel it maybe for couple of days at least, but at that moment, I would argue, that this is diaspora coming into being through their emotion, through their statement, and we can see how uh, these uh, statements interrelate when uh, these people actually uh, come to Africa and say such things. Also, uh, latency, we have latent and blurred identities, diaspora identities also manifest and strong, uh, but there is a whole continuum between them. Uh, for example, John Malkovich, who is the Hollywood actor of Croatian origin, he didn't really, uh, he doesn't speak Croatian, he doesn't care about Croatia, but in 91, 
uh, he was suddenly he became active and uh, appeared on Croatian national television, uh, reciting national anthem in a horrible accent, but still he was uh, he was there. He was somehow mobilized, although he was saying that uh, the only words in Croatian that he heard is from his grandparents, and they were swearing, and that he liked that kind of Croatian uh, character. Uh, that was his point of reference. He used it maybe for a couple of weeks. He, he was not uh, identified again as Croatian Latin, but who knows? You know, it is latent it might uh, reappear. Um, also, when we look at the complexity, uh, those who describe themselves as Latin, who identify as Latin, can have single, double, multiple hybrid identities. But maybe uh, when we look at how the diaspora happens uh, through identity, we can see that uh, there is sometimes a, a core group and uh, all those who uh, join them in different islands. When we researched Croatian diaspora in Sydney, we found that there are people um, who would sometime, sometimes really uh, be active uh, within the community, but had really hybrid identities. They would also be active in the Italian community. They would also um, uh, be engaged in some sort of environmental issues Further on, when we look at the space, diaspora, there is a cross space as well. We can talk about them. When you look at the size of the homeland, it can be, as I said, micro homeland, such as village, or an island, or a macro uh, homeland, such as continent. Uh, also, the number of attachments to homelands there can be one, double, multiple. Many people have uh, several homelands, and uh, diaspora can also uh, appear in such a form. Uh, when we look at the how realistic are these conceptions of homeland, are, and we can see that there are utopic homelands, but also it becomes more real sometimes. To real places, spaces with boundaries, political status of the homeland is important. Sometimes it's a, and uh, most of it is envisaged as a uh, nation state. Also, dispersal across space areas, from one locality to a region like Cuba's in Florida to uh, international and global dispersion. When we look at time, also, we can talk about uh, subdimensional durability, which is important. From transient to durable, from one generation to multi generational or permanent region. Sometimes diasporas are felt, uh, conceived, and made only uh, for a couple of years. Sometimes they really last for decades and hundreds of years. Uh, continuity also, engagement, for example, from sporadic to continuous. And when we look at the intensity of Density uh, within the continuity. It's uh, really small amounts of time spent, felt, uh, spent feeling, thinking, and doing to sometimes 24 7 dedication. But there is also action as well. We can talk about uh, direction towards whole society, towards homeland, towards specific actors and institutions, which can be placed locally, nationally, internationally, globally, or it can be inverted. Many Croatians in Australia, for example, would claim that they are diaspora. They love Croatia a lot, uh, they spend money. But when you look at their action, they're mainly um, dealing with their own issues, going to picnics and uh, fighting who is going to be uh, the leader. But uh, they, they are actually inverted towards, uh, towards themselves. Uh, when you look at the content of action, in the cultural, social, economic, political, mixed, when you look at the coercion involved, then or the level to which individuals are exposed to coercion and social control in homelands and in spaces presently occupied, then we can see that there are different causes of action. It can be intrinsic, such as turmoil in the homeland, or extrinsic, such as discrimination in the host country, and suddenly homeland appears as an interesting option for action. Um, also intensity varies, from benign gatherings to political, radical activism and terrorism. Finally, also organization errors, density or level of incorporation is important. Sometimes individuals are simply uh, know about each other or believe there is a group of people who can be described as diaspora, but also there are loose networks and associations. The incorporation of individual is higher. Finally, there are institutions and even networks of institutions who fight for the government or who help on and debate on also, the scope of this organization can be local, can be national, can be international, transnational, global. And our task in the end, I think, would be to describe the ways in which diaspora exists 
and mirrors within its dimensions, I think we would be surprised to see that there, there are a lot of elements, uh, that there are tendencies, that there are clear tendencies, that there are some regularities that can be found within these variations. So we have to search for like, regularities and tendencies within and between dimensions as well as between cases. Um, in the end, I would say that uh, if we had to give a definition of a pure form of diaspora or pure type, then diaspora would be a matter of degree and the greater the tension between home and homeland, the purer the diaspora in terms of high sense of displacement, emotional engagement, unilateral action, a directional action, radicalism of action, singular identification, high organization, etc. But this does not mean that uh, double, uh, dual identities, multiple identities, hybrid identities, uh, orientation towards itself and uh, irregular feeling, thinking and doing for, on the behalf of uh, the former is not that. I'm just saying that if we really were doing uh, the comparative research between different cases that we would find uh, there are some regularities in these very uh, variations. So instead of um, inventing new terms, instead of uh, trying to um, limit the phenomena in, in such a rigid way, I think that the best way would be to really um, make large comparative research and see how diaspora as a social phenomenon varies across all these uh, dimensions. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, this is my dream. So. And I got the opportunity, so you had to get here. Thank you. Okay. okay, so questions and comments? Just to say, I mean, you know, it's just this is a very theoretical uh, paper, and Sasha does a lot of empirical work. <laughs> Most of his work is very empirical. So it's, it's not that he's just constructing it. Yeah, I realize that <laughs> it's uh, structure it if I want to do uh, a study that uh, can have a generalizable and uh, transferable accounts, then definitely theory is needed. And the theory so far was not, it was not on diaspora, it was not theory, it was just concepts that were more or less not functional. Well, one thing I've always found with scholarship on diaspora is that it tends to focus a lot on what are the criteria that, how do we know it's a diaspora and what criteria are necessary to fulfill that and um, and not so much about why the concept is important. Why do, why is it important? I mean, because there, are, you know, a lot of these, and, and a lot of studies use various different diasporas to show that blah blah blah. Yes, this is a diaspora, right? And especially when we have this whole array of other dynamics and phenomena. Um, that characterize different ways in which people move and the consequences of that mobility in terms of a multiplicity of different directions toward which one identifies different homelands. I mean, you could then talk about, well, when does someone go from being a migrant in a diaspora to an ethnic minority? Because there isn't a, a, time, a, a time frame in which the notion of a homeland, even if it's been generations since your people have been back, that doesn't run out. There can still be this attachment to a homeland that's never been experienced over generations. So, and, and we're talking about a lot of fundamental processes and dynamics in terms of groups as projects, identity, homemaking, living in, you know, having several homelands that can be applied to any group, any collective. And so, so yeah, so why is diaspora important and valuable, um, whether it's conceptually or, or whatever? We can make various different phenomena fit into the criteria and say, there it is. But why is that important? Why do we need to do that as opposed to look at, like, um, transnational positionality. Well, and then you've got the, well, why is transnational a 
not as effective, or you kind of said, you know, transnationalism is sort of, we don't use that anymore, and I think a lot of people do, you know, but that also speaks to the phenomenon of being mobile, living in multiple places at the same time, and, um, and that sort of thing. Well, I think the, the phenomenon itself is relevant, because when we look at the size, uh, we look at the number of people who would describe themselves as diasporans and who would say that yes, there are spaces which I do not inhabit uh, that are very important, it's getting higher. Uh, also, uh, when you look at the political importance of the phenomenon, I think it's also very high. Uh, almost all East European countries have, uh, it's, it's a part of, it's almost, uh, sometimes it's even part of the constitution, where these people who are not inhabiting these territories are a part of the political system. Uh, we have a strategy in Croatia which uh, also lists like, I don't know, 100 million people abroad who are supposed to be Croatian, have Croatian identity and are a part of the nation. Um, maybe, yes, of course they're not, uh, they do not have strong ethnic or they do not have a strong ethnic identity. We will not mobilize around some sort of diaspora project to help Croatia. But this is a political fact, that they are perceived and treated by the, the Croatian political institutions as such. And also, there are many people still, tens of thousands, who uh, regularly gather and uh, give money and uh, do something. But there, are, but there are also different forms of collectivity that do the very same thing. And they're not, either people don't consider themselves diaspora or they're not considered diaspora or, or in the context of academic scholarship, we don't call them a diaspora because there's also the disciplinary thing in terms of, you know, if you look at, you know, the whole range of, you know, let's say just for example, migration studies. So sometimes we're talking about immigrant mobilization and that has all the features of diaspora and people still have connections with home and their homeland connections that affect how people mobilize here. So we are looking at the same type of phenomenon and then, you know, as academics we choose how we want to, what concepts we're going to use. So it, it's out there, it's important, many people say they're part of the diaspora and <coughs> nation states also like to reproduce that notion. But diaspora is a con what is the value? We, we know it's out there, we know it's important, but conceptually, what are we getting out of in terms of the work that we do? Why is it, should we all, should we choose the conceptual framework of diaspora within which to frame work on various aspects of? Um, well, I think there is a, a very important difference. Uh, you have migrant organizations that uh, are organized and their purposes are, for example, to improve uh, the living and working conditions of their membership within a certain society. But, uh, that I might also that only be part of their, their yeah. repertoire of, of... Also, of they might also be, uh, do that. something on the behalf of the so-called homeland, but I think that this tension between <coughs> living here and having the idea that you know, the real space, my space, is somewhere else, is not only... Uh, it is a specific phenomenon. It, is, it differs uh, this phenomenon from any kind of migrant organization that uh, is not. Well, I'm just thinking like asylum seekers in a hostel. A hostel, mm -hmm. you know, there is that section. Right? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. I mean, first of all, I'm wondering whether it catches all the phenomena that you want to catch. So, for example, um, Mexicans migrating to the US it makes no sense to talk about the US problem. Probably too close or bring too many with them. So, uh, I mean, if you're in Texas, you're not in the diaspora. Um, so, it makes no sense to use even these terms or these reference points. Um, and that brings me to the second question. Um, I mean, looking at it from the history, I'm interested in the history of sociology. So, as I say, uh, as a few things that we've tried to address over the past, but one of the things that strikes me is that kind of every time a new field comes along, it wants to claim that they come up with taxonomy of all the various concepts and then goes through the whole catalog that has been available. Um, but it looks more to me I'm mean, a little bit like a cut and paste job. You know? um, so for some it might work it might work in I don't deny for a second that it might work in Croatia, but in other countries it just wouldn't work. Um, 
also I, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, kind of history-free taxonomy I find kind of weird. Um, I mean, talking first about Germans in the US now. Um, so I don't want to give you an alternative talk now, but you know, one of the things we found out was somewhere, you know, the end of the First World War, the whole German identity thing just collapses. Nobody wants to be German anymore. Prohibition, you must have a death wish if you're German. Right? Uh, and then, of course, then comes the Second World War, end of the story. The, one of the biggest ethnic minorities and just you know, literally dies in those years. You know? um, and it's easier to use Herbert Gunn's word, you know, um, you know, symbolic forms of identity that you could acquire. Lots of studies have been made to great effect uh, in, in the US in particular. Um, think about Richard Alba. You know, sometimes I read this and I think this is kind of just a negative catalogue of pendant to Alba's work in the US. Um, my, my work, isn't it? I'm not saying it's not useful, but I'm just not so sure. It's, it still seems to me like a giant patchwork. Uh, considering, like, for example, Mex uh, Mexicans in Texas, yes, it might be that they do not feel this tension and have uh, some sort of transnational arrangements uh, which allows them to live simultaneously or connect simultaneously in several locations. They do not have this tension between home and home, definitely not. They live in a transnational social space. They constitute transnational social space. But uh, when there is a tension, then we're talking about different phenomena, different, um, sometimes even different people, different group of people. So I would say that yeah, diaspora is still uh, visible as a social phenomenon and it needs to be studied in a specific way. Um, for example, in um, what we researched in Croatia were uh, Chinese uh, transnational uh, small attention nerds. They do not have any, they're not homesick, they do not engage for their uh, uh, micro diasporic uh, communities uh, left behind. They simply have a global strategy of expanding the uh, Zhejiang area all over the world, uh, starting from Europe. So it's a different kind of film. They feel different things, they uh, think about different things. Uh, there are, however, people who uh, give a lot of time, thought, emotions, money uh, for specific areas somewhere else. And um, interestingly, Chris Cromford is came recently with an idea of a uh, new concept, strangeness, which describes this uh, loss of orientation. And um, one of the answers to this loss of orientation might be precisely constructing homeland somewhere else uh, and then doing something about it. You can help it, create it, recreate it. Uh, you don't have to have physical contact with it at all. There are many people who are donating money and um, helping even nation states and regions without uh, being solidary with others, but still they, precisely because they feel that there is a so called homeland somewhere, they are doing something. And therefore, I would say it's a specific uh, social phenomenon. Of course, not all migrants, I mean, even Gabriel Schaeffer finally realized that not all um, migrants with certain or their descendants with a specific ethnic identity automatically are part of uh, the group. That's something that uh, Rube is heavily criticized. It is perception sometimes of the institutions of the nation states, states that they left, uh, see them in such a way, but they do not feel, act, and behave. Uh, such a yes, so, so it's, it's very centered, that, you know, it's very, you know, uh, I mean, no diaspora without a center, right, from which you disperse. Um, so, but the agenda is then set by the center, and not by, I mean, you could think about constellations or configurations um, where that isn't the case, uh, or then over years it phases out. Can, can I try yeah. rephrase, I think? Um, I, I imagine you might be trying to say a um, couple of things um, is if I was given the option between Brubaker and Donald Black um, and it's the first time I've heard of the Donald Black work um, I'm he's not doing on diaspora, he's doing mainly on the wall on violence I'm yeah. just, uh, I, I, I think I would go with Brubaker rather than even though I have my problems with Brubaker um, There's something to do with that conception that I, I want to kick in touch for, for a minute, 
Um, one is to do with what would you say to somebody who said that um, to the extent that the concept of diaspora as an idea, as something that has been integrated into uh, cultural, political uh, discourse, um, probably over the course of the last century, maybe a little bit longer, um, that it's a, a cultural artifact which generates certain kinds of institutions and practices and feelings afterwards. And then we have here a project of trying to get a, a, a theory of this cultural artifact as if it was an independently existing thing. You could argue, what would you say to somebody who says maybe diaspora is best being, and that really all it is is a subtype of the multitudinous um, polymorphous relationships to something one can call a homeland, which needn't be a state, needn't be a territory, needn't even be on earth, it could be heaven. Um, that it's simply that, that what seems to be the axis around which this is revolving is, like Andreas is saying, some imagined place um, towards which one has some kind of loyalty and sacrificial relationship. You may happen to live in that place, in which case it's your nation state. You may happen not to live in it, in which case it's over there. That perhaps diaspora is just a name given to that a relationship between some people and a sacred place. And that sacred place can take multiple forms, and they, and they can have relationships too. I think in the pure form, it's precisely what you describe. But then, someone, then the argument of why we need um, a complicated, multi-dimensional typology for something that is clearly a subset of a more general phenomenon. What, 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 what's the, what are the benefits of, which of, of the relationship to some sacred place? Well, the term is diaspora, but uh, we can call it differently if you want. I, I think that this tension is constitutive of the phenomenon itself. If, if we want to have another word, maybe we can find it, but it, it, it has been produced culturally and uh, through publishing in uh, as diaspora. Now it's, it's used even by the people who do it, therefore I, um, I, don't, I don't know which other phenomenon with other, uh, which is um, encircling diaspora, which you are referring. So, you know, do we have a term for it? Or that it's still a symbolic construction of identities. It happens in every nation state. But it's not based on the uh, it's well, on Here, I'm talking this, that, that's the difference of specific that you are not talking about. It's not there. And this is uh, you know, something that really drives, it, it, drives, it drives people to do something. Well, that's why I don't agree that you have to start at a certain minimum distance in order to study it. I found it a total loony idea. Um, I mean, that's just bizarre. Okay, can I raise a, di a different question? Okay, that, that perhaps I didn't formulate it well, but I'm just... The, 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 the thrust of the paper was diaspora is a defaced concept. It has multiple meanings, it can indicate a variety of things, that at least makes a prima facie case, but perhaps this isn't really an analytic concept, it doesn't have a lot of teeth, um, and, so, and then Blue Baker comes along and really pushes the book out very, very hard on that and says, no, 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 this is... We're best off ditching this, and then it says, oh, it's, really, it's a category of practice. Standard would make a take on, on those things. Um, and then you come in and say, well, no, it's much more than that, it's a sensibility, uh, it's a, it, gener it generates uh, all kinds of um, consequences and outcomes. And rather than rule make take, maybe we need to draw on uh, Donald Black's notion of, of, of what constitutes a social phenomenon and this notion of social geometry and various dimensions. Which and the axes and measures, um, and we can do this on the whole, we can, you know, motion, space, time, action, organization, we can do all kinds of things like that. Um, so, the, um, I've lost a train of thought, um, I was trying to put back, if, what about the idea that somebody says, yeah, it is a failed concept, you know, I take Brubaker's case, we can live without it, and the various phenomena we call diaspora are what we can call the kinds of relations people have to uh, a sacred space. Let's even say the notion of homeland is some kind of imagined space that people have some kind of sacred relationship to. So we can even take the concept of homeland and say that's just a, an embodiment or I mean, a manifestation of the more general concept of sacred space. And then we can plot out the multitudinous relationships people have to some kind of sacred space. Um, 
and, and we, let's have a theory of that. Let's generate a black inside theory of dimensions and relationships to that. And therefore, we can um, we, we have a more general theory rather than uh, one that, on the face of it, presents itself as a good, robust theory, but for what is recognizably a highly idiosyncratic, historically contingent phenomenon. Let's have a general theory of something that's a little bit more durable, a little bit more constant. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we don't need it. We don't need it. What would be your response? That would be a great solution. Uh, if, if we can really uh, say which, which processes uh, of like the, the constitution of the sacred places, is it, is it wider? Is it uh, influencing more uh, within everyday social life? Uh, does it influence more people who describe similar things that they feel, imagine, and do? I would say then yes, of course, definitely. We should ask, look for uh, explaining how these uh, sacred places actually emerge and why are they important today. But um, perhaps it's not the answer to it. I, I don't think Kant is an answer to it. Theory of a symbolic ethnicity uh, would cover the complexity of sacred places that are not. No, I'd put in a more advanced uh, version of. Uh... I, I'm not saying I go along with that, I'm not saying I, I, but it's kind of the. the, the if we would take the, what seems to me the impetus behind the black idea is an aspiration to a highly formal and highly abstract theory. I think that's fine, but, well, I don't. But um, uh, I, a highly formal, highly abstract theory makes sense for a highly formal, highly general phenomenon. But that's was highly specific. And it seems like to me there's something in the wrong headed about trying to do a kind of a, a revamped Parsonian typology of what is a peculiarity of you know the, the, the modern Western world of the last 150 years. Um, um, but okay. no, you're right. I, mean, yeah. I think Black would argue the same. I mean, if he had seen this, he would, he would have said, like, "Okay, law is much wider and can be can be conceived like this. Um, but yeah. Corruption as well, maybe, but the aspirates people too specific. Uh, what then? What kind of phenomenon are we talking about? What kind of phenomenon are you describing, basically?" When you're saying sacred places, can, can I? Is it, is it, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. The, the, the question, the original question I had before, and echoing with Andreas, was a concern over time and historicity and movement. Um, if we go back to the core elements, whatever about our homeland and relationships to homeland and, and the discrepancy between your current location. We imagine home, and the first thing that we look at is dispersion. And the dispersion of populations is about movement. Um, and the story of diasporas will often be a case of movement, and then we have temporal change and multi generations whereby the origin story fades and becomes a myth. It's no longer a relationship to a homeland. It might be for the grandparents or the great grandparents. So, my inclination would be to say if there is really something in Europe that if, if one is to take some form of social geometry, in the nature of geometry, Euclidean and otherwise, it's static. Mm -hmm. uh, diaspora, in its essence, is mobile and mobile. And, and if you wanted to take the kind of, what you know, don't need is social geometry and social calculus. You need this is what I said. Yeah, I said I'm not using social geometry. It's too rigid, precisely. But why? Why? But the ontology is interesting. The, the ontology of the okay, I, I, I missed the bit. What do you mean by the, the, uh, the phenomena do exist um, through specific kinds of actions that appear to us to be uh, only individual. So um, you have an increase of, of certain type of uh, activities. And certain, there is an ebb and flow of different kinds of uh, social phenomena. For example, more people listening to music is, through, the, through, uh, through this perspective, more music. Is a constant, uh, um, and we can also say why is there more music and more listening and more producing music in certain times, also in the historical perspective. Uh, but definitely, if we look at it uh, only from uh, the point of view of motivation and goals and uh, just 
circumstances in which uh, individuals decide, then I'm, I'm saying we are maybe missing a wider picture. And uh, sometimes diasporic phenomena, for example, disappear. People do assimilate this one, but then suddenly it reappears, and um, some descendants of these people who migrated rediscover that become that. So, uh, an interesting example would be Burgerland Croat minority in Austria. They are the descendants of people who left uh, Croatia in the 16th century and uh, were constructed as an ethnic minority within Austria in the last maybe 100 years, uh, claiming to be of authentic Austrian ethnic linguistic minority. But then the new generation emerged uh, precisely because this had, they had this institutional framework, they could relate to Croatia, travel to Croatia, listen to Croatian pop music. And suddenly, rediscovering Croatia as some sort of homeland, which their fathers would never say did. Um, so, but you're just describing the, your whole talk, the last five minutes was about choice, but you just earlier explained to us how this choice has yeah, been elim I'm, eliminated I'm, from. Exactly, I'm trying to change the perspective. I'm saying I'm succeeding. Okay. This is what I'm looking for. This is what I'm suggesting. So, you want to bring choice back into. No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, you know, explain this phenomenon from. The point of view that we already have, that we should actually change it and, and look at it how it happens as it happens. Um, so, there are talking those guys who decide that that's not important to them. That's a choice they make. That's not what guns means by symbolic identity. It's a matter of choice. And if you look at the, the, the entire discussion from the US in the last 20 years, Richard Alba, the ethnic uh, the study that he did about upper state uh, New York and Albany, the creation. You could, uh, yeah, the uh, creation of a new the identity that didn't exist before. It, it was a matter of choice. I mean, the very fact that you go to, you know, Italians that have, have, don't speak Italian, yes, they go to Italian folk festivals, but it's open up to other things where they eat pizza. I mean, it's as much identity as you get, uh, or go to whatever German beer festivals or drink Guinness on mass. Yes, but the uh, question is why is there, there an ebb and flow? And why are there similarities between different? And why it's at the same time? Um, if we look at internally, the structure of the whole phenomenon, maybe I have suspect. Yeah, generational cohorts, I mean, matters of integration, all kinds of, uh, I mean, the usual concepts that you get for uh, when you study these things. I mean, there's nothing, this seems to be a little bit like the, the, just a negative pendant of those who've left behind in the homeland and want to discover that there's more than their homeland out there. Mm. Well, those who returned recently. Again, I'm not familiar with the long black I mean, I read a little bit of it, I didn't really get much of it. I think I have to read it more. But I was just thinking, uh, you know, in, in the context of what you were saying, uh, is this a sort of a formalist sociology? I mean, I was just trying to relate these ideas to classical sociologists. I mean, you know, there is some resemblance of Zemmel there with dialects and triads. Uh, what's the relation between pure phenomena and ideal time? In the very sense, I mean, kind of the attack on methodological individualism is this Lacanian thing? So, so I mean, how does, does this all relate to classical sociology? It does relate, <laughs> although Black himself never, he's, he's attacking uh, classical sociology, saying that there was never practically a uh, scientific revolution within sociology, but in parallel is a multiple. And uh, he believes that uh, he's stopping everything. Uh, when his critics are describing him, they're describing as as leukemia. Because the, uh, these types of statements that he makes look specifically like the statements on suicide. Uh, look very similar. But uh, this is a different type of uh, formalism. Uh, he's not really giving any tribute to Zimmel, though Zimmel is speaking specifically about uh, social geometry. Uh, nevertheless, it is diff diff a different time type of formalism. So Zimmel's formalism is, is microsociology. He's speaking about the forms, but these forms are um, basically the content is the uh, emotion, is the motivation to enter some sort of relationship. But it becomes, this relationship becomes a form because it's uh, suddenly detached from these contents that brought us together to interrelate in a specific way and have their own dynamics. Um, Black is, he says he's not micro, not macro, because 
whenever a certain instance of a human behavior occurs, uh, it, it has basically uh, also a quantitative dimension. There can be more of education or less of education. More of education when more people participate, that there are more grades, there are more educational things going on. Uh, but then he would look at the um, all the subjects within the situation, uh, their statuses, their attributes, and then he would predict what would come out of the situation based on uh, these attributes and statuses that they have. Uh, with the usual um, explanation that you know the chances are greater or smaller when he talks about the outcomes. Therefore, um, it's not really um, something that you can use to predict specifically what would be the outcome of a certain situation. For example, when corruption happens and you have um, dislocation of public resources to individual hands, uh, you just have to argue that uh, there is the more people are organized in such a process, the more clandestine this is, uh, the less uh, social control from below there is in the whole process, the more corruption will be. And I look at the small countries where everybody is like acquainted, uh, and there is really no social control uh, of um, <coughs> um, placing public um, money to uh, potential users, then you see that there is more corruption. But is it because of its internal structure or because of other reasons we can't say? Therefore, it is a different kind of formalism. Okay. I, I remain puzzled. I, I tried to follow the paper from the beginning to end. I have the paper in the notes here. Mm -hmm. And I'm puzzled by um, how you see, how you relate to the work of Brubaker and Black. In other words, what is, is the Donald Black work? I have my papers on the Donald Black stuff. And you said that you're not going with Donald Black. And then I was wondering, what, what, what's the role of the Donald Black vision of sociology, this approach? Um, if you've discounted it, what's your relationship to it? Is it you, you, you think that there's some stuff rescuable from it, that you can rummage around in the ashes of the Donald Black sociology and you can make use of it? It's not unclear to me what you <laughs> see, what you, what you want to take from it. Okay, I'm just saying that uh, Brubaker is limiting us basically to study mobilization around certain claims and uh, ideas, or the use of these claims and ideas. I think that's, that's not enough precisely because uh, people do not only engage in rally around uh, projects, but because they deeply internally feel uh, the same thing. Uh, Black is saying basically that you know, social phenomena occur in a certain form and that uh, in order to explain this sociologically, we have to disregard uh, individual feelings and uh, motivations and uh, uh, emotions in general. I would say that uh, you cannot explain certain phenomena without using the uh, individual feelings as well. But when we look at the phenomenon, how it happens, then we, we see that you know, these feelings are similar, that they are uh, spread over a certain population, that they are felt at the same time that also the day vary in their intensity uh, through time. Therefore, uh, you know, there is a wider sort of structure that's of the whole phenomenon that uh, uh, tells you that this is not only something that is uh, completely individual and it is idiosyncratic and so on. Uh, so, black is anti-emotions, anti-individual, anti he killed the person. I'm saying that uh, phenomena, as they happen, happen also through feelings and uh, we, can, we cannot have these symmetric, geometric kind of statements, but we should try to uh, find, uh, you know, are there really some regularities? Uh, so why not, try, why not try Luhmann? Why not try? <laughs> well, why might be more evident, you know, that you don't get the hiccups about to incentive and diaspora, and you go straight mm -hmm. for world society as it exists, and identify systemic patterns there, including its differences. It sounds to me much more elegant, uh, more rational than messing about between Santa and Jasper. Thank you for the comments. I'll see if this can be a one. Just a nice spontaneous idea, you know. When, 
a beatificare cu pietre de toate ca să nu mai facă mai ales în soluții. And you can criticize both black and blue at the same time and so do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. of, of course, you get into the problem, the problem then with, with, with the diaspora concept. No? Because for the moment, that would be one that would be a disputable problem. Okay. Any other questions? I have a question of clarification. Um, when you talk about the tension between the home and homeland, What do you mean by it? Uh, sometimes it is perceived, you know, people do uh, see that um, and claim that uh, they do not inhabit or they perceive sacred land. So the higher distension is, the uh, more visible it is through emotions, through uh, ideas about the whole land as some sort of sacred place. So this is, I would say, the um, The tension is in, in the feeling that it's some sort of some sort of unnatural situation that is difficult to bear. That is the burden. And just out of curiosity, how would you measure that? Would you do it through interviews or? Yes, I, I would say that uh, you would need really a transnationally organized, uh, plurilocal, comparative, qualitative, uh, and quantitative work. It's very difficult. I mean, uh, transnational ethnography is developing at the moment. I'm not saying that people are very coordinated. It takes a lot of time on it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.